We need you to get a little bit more open-minded, okay? So I've got a, a crop circle there. Um, and this, this particular crop circle uh, from 2008 is the Avery uh, crop circle, which showed the alignment of 21st December 2012. <clears throat> now, what I find is interesting is um, People are attracted to the crop circle stuff. I mean, they're magnificent, aren't they? I mean, and um, it's pretty obvious to us that they're not just made by a farmer, Fred, or somebody um, doing a hoax prank. Right? Uh, and the, the first crop circle movie that we showed in Magpie House five years ago is called Star Dreams. We had, yeah, we had 90 people there. You know, uh, very popular. Um, you know, small space, about half this size. It was pretty crowded. So people are attracted by these things, right? And they go, ooh, wow, ah, yeah, isn't that great? Yeah. But then when you start talking to them about extraterrestrial stuff and where the stuff comes from, that seems to be taboo, right? And so that's why I'm asking you to be open-minded because I've got some stuff to share, right? Uh, which takes us beyond just the, the patterns. Um, so on the right side of the slide shows um, a news event. So this is this is mainstream almost. Uh, what if the biggest solar storm on record happened today? Uh, there was a, a huge solar storm in 1859, the Carrington event, which if it, if it happened today, uh, there's some science which says it would knock out most of the electricity grid around the world. And because it would destroy the large transformers, uh, it would take years to repair. Now, can you imagine what that would mean for our society in a city like this? Right? Can you imagine not having electricity, not just for a day or a week, for a few months, but a few years. Right? It's just unimaginable. Right? There would be no services, no transport, no commerce. Um, yeah, transport not, not public or, or private, because you wouldn't be able to get fuel. Um, no food. No food in the supermarket. No supermarkets, mm. because you can't get the food to the supermarkets. Um, because you can't get the fuel. Um, it's important but then, that you don't think about things like that because this is, well, if you're at the crossroads and you start thinking the what ifs, you will create them. Uh, yeah, I mean, yeah, if we're prepared, if you prepare yourself for the worst without hurrying or panicking, not a problem. Uh, we, we think we have no time, but we're actually surrounded by eternity. Right? <laughs> Uh, that's one of the, um, the quotes from the Castaneda works. Yeah, so you've got no time, but you're surrounded by eternity, time-wise and space-wise. Yeah. So be prepared for the worst is, is what it recommends, just like the Boy Scouts recommend. Um, but then I started getting another report, emails of another report, also related to solar flares. Um, and this one's a, a, a far more nightmarish scenario. Uh, we've got 700 nuclear power plants around the world, right? If the electricity fail, system failed, yeah, we've got backup batteries. I mean, how long are they going to last? You know, they might last a few hours. But then you've got backup diesel generators. Um, and, and the purpose of that backup is to cool the, the rods. And if you don't cool the rods, um, the, it goes into meltdown. So you've got potential of 700 nuclear reactors all going into meltdown around the world after a week. Uh, it's unimaginable. You know, we had one nuclear um, reactor uh, meltdown in Japan last year. Can you imagine a dozen or 700? Yeah. Three? Do you think we as a consciousness really want to put ourselves through that sort of stuff? 
Sorry? Stating um, uh, what I've read in in, um, well, what, in scientific what, reports. What, what, what's your inner feeling? What's, what, what's coming from your heart? Not what people read. What's coming from inside you? Do you really feel like you're going to, as a consciousness, going to call that in? No. Well, I, the way I operate, and, yeah. and this is what I've, I've I've told people for years, is if you're going to do something like an intentional community, um, right? You do it from joy, not fear, right? Yeah. Your primary motive needs to be joy, not fear. I'm not doing it to run away. I'm doing it to fulfil my my soul's purpose. Don't get into fear. That's 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 the wrong reasons. You know, there's a lot of information there about earth changes, um, and I touched on that at the beginning. Um, and Yeah, okay, well, um, I'll just go on with this. I mean, I'm just presenting stuff that came to me, and I thought, wow, you know, this is amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and it's just something that I've just been thinking about. Um, and, and I think it's really important to understand that, you know, the crop circle itself, 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 the crop um, that sounds to me like some massive coronal mass ejection. Yeah, on one mm -hmm. parallel that might happen. Sorry? On, on one parallel universe that could happen. But we're looking at multiple parallel universes here, there are multiple outcomes. Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm interested in this one. <laughs> well, you jump around to different ones too. You, don't, you wouldn't even be aware of it. But mm. you, know, you might think you're in a parallel where the sun's going to explode, but I can tell you that's not going to happen. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Can okay. I share this at this present time, uh, Makati at Mount Tennant Creek, yeah. the indigenous elders there that they have um, uh, gone, the come to Victoria, have gone throughout Australia to say, please stop the radioactive waste dump, which now it's going to be in that place because through um, um, Australian um, mining uranium on contract, all radioactive waste dump has to be buried here. And it's going to be in market at the present time. Okay, so you know we might sort of, I mean, uh, you know, whether we bring something out in the consciousness, I'm not at that level of understanding. All I know is we have indigenous law here. Indigenous people have said they know that radioact um, mining, uranium mines is no good. And even the lady um, at market to the other, they came to, to Victoria, and she says. We black fellas don't need electricity. It's the you white fellas. You need the electricity. You put it into your backyard. But then she said, she said, but in time it will come through the air and will come through the water and it will hurt your children. So what I say to people, you know, how do we stop? How do we have the elders there who've got the message? We have the law of country on this country, like I called Australia. But no one is listening to the indigenous elders of this country. Yeah, what I'm, what I'm hearing there, I mean, um, the, yeah, what, I'm, what I'm hearing there is um, one point of view is saying, well, well just don't think about it, it won't happen. Uh, on, on the other hand, um, there's forces 
market forces and work corpora corporations which are making it happen. Um, and so, can we ignore that? I don't know. Um, George, do you know that a lot of the top end of Australia... Sorry? Do you know that the top end of Australia has got a lot of big lakes that the mining companies have been using their water from, which is so polluted that if you stick your hand in, it will burn your hand off. And there's mm. lakes right across the top of Australia like that. But do you hear about that? No. no. I mean, yeah, we, but it's polluted, yeah. the underground water supply. Yeah. So if we continue those waves, exactly. um, the, the collective energy is going to bring on this No matter how good your energy, you can't turn that water into... Yeah. Why? So I, I go. I follow the advice from that Castaneda saying, "Be prepared for the worst, yeah. but don't hurry or panic about it." Right? So um, this is just another part which, which you know, you're saying not panicking, but yeah. the people are suffering in the outback. And I mean, I live and breathe, and I research of you know the the problems that our elders are having in the outback. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And I can tell you, somebody talked about, you know, somebody predicted. Well, Imelda had said to me that there was a dream time story when they saw the first boat coming to the East Coast, that that was the end of their peoples. Well, can I go on? Because I've got uh, yeah, yeah, some yeah, yeah. ideas for you, uh, which might help. Um, yeah, this is, this is a presentation which I put onto a couple of CDs we, we did last year. Steve channeling the blue ones. And there's some pretty good advice on there in this particular channeling. Um, what uh, they had to say was, it's very important now to set your intentions for beyond 2012, um, because it may not be an easy ride. Right? Um, and because of, uh, the more we resist, the more, we, uh, the more problems we're gonna have. Um, it's not going to be for the faint-hearted, it's their actual words, right? And so I, I, I went to the trouble of asking, well, what, what's going to happen, right? And that's a mistake, because uh, they came back to me and said, um, what's happening? Well, what do you wish to create, right? So in other words, they're saying, they're putting the power back to us. They're saying, it's our responsibility, right? It's not nobody else's. Uh, what, what do you wish to create? Uh, fearful thoughts attract fearful circumstance, so don't be in fear about it. You know, there might be chaos around you, uh, be, but be calm and centred if something really does happen. Yeah. To, add, to add to that point, not to, not to just be in fear or make anything happen, but to have the intention to create, you know. Um, Yeah, the, um, the conversation material says, work on the grandest version of the highest vision. Why would you want anything less? <laughs> it's obvious. Um, yeah, doubtful intention manifests a doubtful future. So you need to be very clear. Um, the vision that I'm working with is very clear. Uh, that I believe, anyway. <laughs> okay. Choose destiny, not fate. So that's a powerful presentation. Now the teachers of um, the guy that channels the blue ones uh, uh, gave me uh, his teacher's book, which is Journey into the New Millennium, from Claire, Claire Boyd, Wendy Mon Monroe. And um, yeah, pretty powerful book. This was written in the 1990s <clears throat> and the the question of what's happening to the earth in terms i mean we, we've heard about oh we're going to elevate our consciousness awareness and all this sort of stuff this is we're going into the golden age and all this and it's all going to happen automatically or well, maybe, maybe it doesn't happen automatically uh, what it's saying uh, I'll, I'll read this this out to you because it's a bit mind-blowing Imagine what the planet Mars looks like. Very barren, yes. You see Mars with third dimensional eyes. When we look at Mars, we see something very different. When we look at Mars, we see something very different. We see a place which is rich and beautiful, 
with streams, rivers and waterfalls. It is a rich and inhabited planet on its other dimensions. In the same way, your planet Earth will look barren on its third dimensional expression. It will not be able to sustain life as you know life to be. The third dimensional world will cease to exist as it is at this time. Um, that, that's a pretty mind-blowing idea, isn't it? Uh, and it's not an isolated um, uh, item just in this book. I've seen this idea from a number of different sources, right? Uh, and once again, you don't have to panic about it, right? It, we, we're heading into a time where we need to raise our vibration. Right? We might, some of us might have heard that um, the Earth is going to go through its ascension, uh, and it's not going to wait for us. It, it's, it's had enough. It wants to evolve. Right? And it's inviting us to join. And the only way we can join is to change our vibration, uh, go into a, a fifth dimensional awareness. Um, now, we will be offering workshops at Magpie House um, of, of going from a third dimensional to a fifth dimensional perspective. Uh, and, and that's coming up pretty soon, in the next couple of months. Um, so that's, uh, like I said, it's not an isolated idea uh, that I've seen. It came out in, it also came out uh, in a, another presentation in Magpie House, uh, and this blew my mind. I wasn't, I didn't go out looking for it, it just appeared. Uh, Nino Borsari is a clinical hypnotherapist that's been working at Magpie for about uh, four or five years, I think. And he's, I consider him very talented at his work. And every year, the last few years, he's done a talk at Magpie House. And uh, after his first talk, I said to him uh, that he's exactly right. I mean, he, he's, he, with the, uh, the past life regression stuff that he works with has uh, been scientifically um, uh, let's say verifiable. It, it's um, there's tens of thousands of cases now which they've documented of past life regression, and it does show a common thread. Uh, and the stuff that he was presenting um, was pretty much precisely uh, what the Mind Over Matter book was describing. You know, the one I, I found. I came across 30 years ago. There's identical information uh, thereabouts. And he was surprised that I, I already knew this stuff because he only learned it 10 years ago. It only came through the scientific community 10, 15, or well, maybe 20 years ago. Right? Uh, but now it's, 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 a, it's become a science in its own right. So, and it's, you know, there's a, there's a lag. The science took a while to catch up. Um, but anyway, in the presentation that Nino did last year, I asked him to talk on planetary evolution uh, because of some of the conversations we've had, right? And what he shared on this, on this particular DVD, uh, or, or we've got the DVD from the, from the session, uh, he, he shared future lives, not past lives, right? Um, and so there's transcripts in there of a future time on this planet. And uh, the information was remarkable uh, because it... it, it um, I'll, I'll read you some of it. Yeah, Nino asked me about family and how I got there. Well, I was clear I did not come with my family. I had just turned up there because I wanted to be there. He asked if I had teleported, and yes, I had. <clears throat> Just by thinking where you want to be, you could be there. Yes, I had a family like a mum and a dad, but in this time, that was not significant. I belonged to this tribe, and this group of people was boundaryless. 
They were all as close to me as my family of birth. So nuclear family, in the way we know it, had simply ceased to be. When Nino pressed me about my parents, it seemed like a moot point. Yes, I was born in the way humans are now, uh, are now, but the fact that they were biological mother and father held no meaning or significance. In this dimension, there was only love and a complete absence of fear of every type, and I was limitly close, limitlessly close to everyone, present and unseen. Okay, so that, what, what that describes is um, a tribal collective. We're still human. We've still got organs. Um, we still have people around us. Uh, but we're able to teleport. Right? We raise the vibration. Uh, and we could say, well, we've gone into the fifth vibration. Um, and the children belong to the collective. It's the same as the, uh, the conversations material, which suggested that children belong to the collective, to the tribe, not to individual parents. <coughs> A little bit more information from that same, those same transcripts. The world as we had known it was barren and desolate. It was a hundred years in the future. The shack was just posts with animal skins pulled across for a roof. Yet this scene carried none of the despair that we might imagine. It was the opposite. It was like floating around in calm, loving, uninterrupted happiness. Not a trace of suffering. In fact, I did not even notice the desert nature of the physical surroundings until Nino's questions had me look around. I would not e have even considered the surrounds anything less than perfect had I ha not had the perspective of this time and place by comparison. Okay, so we're describing a time a hundred years into the future, perhaps. Right? The Earth has become like Mars perhaps, right? And the only way to exist on the planet is to raise the vibration. Um, yeah, the source of this information is from what Nino calls highly evolved souls, right? So when he takes them into a very deep trance, he can recognise when the, the soul is young or when the soul is highly evolved. And he takes the trouble to ask them what's going on. And um, he says he's getting more and more similar information now along this line. Uh, Nino asked me about how the world had come to be like this from life as we know it at the moment. Uh, this made me very uncomfortable and my mind kicked in a little, but I was deep in this experience and I found I quite naturally knew the answers. The world as we knew, know it literally collapses overnight. This collapse is caused by natural disasters, many simultaneously. It needs to be this way, swift and complete. I can see clearly from this new type of human body that there is no cohabitation of old and new. No phasing across. The two systems of being are so vastly different, so qualitatively and quantitatively far from each other, that there is no getting there by degrees. They are not two to three steps apart, they are thousands of steps apart. You can't take people on that journey gently. It needs to be, it needs to be burned down and create space for something altogether different in every way. The people that survive are those that they can instantly flip into the new vibration within their existing human body. Uh, again, the future that's described has got the elements of a highly evolved being society that we've already discussed. It's also got elements of, say, the Reing Cedars, Anastasia 
ability. Anastasia tells us that um, she's just an ordinary human being and that we've all got the abilities that she possess, possesses, including teleportation. Um, it's our belief systems which are holding us back. Right? Now what the blue ones have to say about belief systems is, um, apart from setting our intentions for beyond 2012, is that we must release all our beliefs, all our perceptions, all our viewpoints. Right, because they're not based on truth. Uh, a very good saying I came across recently was, um, reality is everything, but that's not truth. Truth is no thing. Right, and that might be a little bit hard to swallow, but it, to me it was obvious what that was saying. Uh, in fact, this whole universe, is created by our collective minds merely from judgments. Um, and our journey back home is to get rid of all those perceptions and beliefs and judgments. Um, what I'm suggesting is um, be open minded to this information. You know, look at the idea that. Uh, we may be elevating to that higher vibration and it's not necessarily going to be easy um, just like creating those uh, intentional communities it's hard work um, but if you can stay calm and centered and not get into fear about it no matter what the chaos might be around us and I'm not saying these things are going to happen I'm just saying this is the stuff that's been coming across my path, you know, just by investigating this information. You know, I, I don't um, go looking for it, it just appears almost. Uh, just like at the beginning of this, this year, the movies I was showing at Magpie were all extraterrestrial. Uh, I didn't choose that, right? I, I just started getting all these extraterrestrial movies. Right? What is the source of the crop circles? Are people asking themselves that, or are they just saying, oh, aren't they pretty patterns? Well, perhaps there's more to it, right? Do we want to know what the source of those patterns are and what they mean? <clears throat> you know, like I said um, earlier, um, we're planning to run some workshops with a particular source of, you know, be open-minded, extraterrestrial information, <laughs> which takes us from third dimensional to fifth dimensional. Um, and one other thing I'll say about that is don't panic too much about when it's going to happen. I, I, I've got information which is saying it could be decades away. Right? But up until that time, we have to, um, from what I, I can understand, uh, it would do us a lot of good to head towards the tribal type collective instead of the city-based uh, unsustainable way. Okay. Oh, Faye is um, another um, one of our practitioners at Magpie House, and uh, apart from traditional Ch Chinese biological medicine, she also does biological. Oh, yeah. Apart from TCM, yeah, she also does biological en energetic medicine. And uh, I loved her quote that all natural medicine is vibrational medicine. Right? So we could say that uh, the vibrational stuff is there. We just have to access it and, and allow it into our belief systems. Yeah, so I've also got her talk on DVD. Well, this is a bunch of <laughs> text from the Reem Cedars books, um, uh, which I won't go into too much, but one of the most powerful ideas, which I mentioned earlier tonight, was the idea of co-creation. If you're not doing it with a collective, you might as well be not be doing it at all. 
what my observation of the ringing cedars movement in Australia is, yeah, there's lots of little startup groups all over the place. And my observation is that none of them are going anywhere because they're all trying to do it individually. Right? Um, perhaps we can change that paradigm by trying to work together. There's some very powerful stuff in the Ring Cedars books. Uh, the debate is still there whether she exists, does it really matter? Um, even Eleni, Eleni Tortelli, who started the natural birth movement, came out of Siberia. Um, well, she's got some comments on the Ring Cedars book. She says um, she can't. Uh, uh, verify the link back into the Vedic civilization that she talks about. But as far as she was concerned, she was in, the, in, the, in Siberia in the 1980s and she said there were thousands of Anastasias, Anastasias, right? Because of the, the rapid changes that were happening in, happening in the Soviet Union and Siberia, people had to change dramatically. And they had to they actually had to get their hands into the earth and start tilling the earth with their hands, not big mechanical contraptions, otherwise they were gonna starve. It's a common Russian name, what do you mean starving? Sorry? It's a common Russian name, Anastasia. Yeah. Dashniks. It's a common Russian name. Anastasia. So there are, you know, obviously yeah. yeah, well uh, Eleni said um, there were thousands of Anastasias. Um, yeah. And it's creating a massive movement. Uh, it's even suggested in the books that um, the Earth uh, was going to go through a cataclysmic time in the early 1990s, and that was prevented by the tens of millions of Russians digging their hands into the Earth, because the Earth is a sentient being and can feel every pair of hands working with it. Okay, so I thought that was interesting. <laughs> Yeah, um, to to the to the discussion of whether she's real or not. Even um, if you take into consideration the existence and you know being well documented of the school existence of the school where the children teach themselves. Yeah. yeah. By by her, you know that that she lives. Uh, even if she's not real, the school is. Yeah, the movement was there. <laughs> yeah, um, I've heard commentaries that yeah the stuff was based on fact, mm -hmm. uh, and Anastasia says in the books, "I exist for whom I exist." So make up your own mind. Does it really matter? Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay. Oh yeah, the Ramtha stuff. Um, that was another powerful influence for us to go out there and find land. But I find that um, the Rumpha, let's say devotees, uh, come from a point of view that they know something that we don't. Um, <laughs> which I've had a little bit of trouble with. Uh, but there's some very powerful Rumpha material which uh, can perhaps guide us on the way. You know, one of them says that um, it is only recently that humanity ceased harvesting and growing their own food and putting provisions away. <clears throat> Today, with all of your convenience, it seems rather silly to store food. But, um, if you desire to sustain, find a piece of land and love it. It will love you back. I love that quote. Um, with, the ch with the weather changes in the days that are coming, man is, is in the most vulnerable position he has ever lived in because he has moved away from the good earth. <clears throat> and there's more. Everyone wants to be the near the water, on the coast, or in the jungle. Let them have it. It's not going to be there anymore. Well, I don't know if it's going to be there anymore. Um, but anyway, there's some pretty powerful stuff there. <clears throat> 